My name is Jennifer Johnson, and I was a research associate for the exhibition Art and Industry in Early America, Rhode Island Furniture, 1650 to 1830. As part of the exhibition, we were looking to include objects that told the story of early Rhode Island upholstery. One object we chose was this easy chair from the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. The chair is rare in two ways. First, it has survived with what is currently thought to be its original needlework upholstery. And second, we know the name of the man who upholstered it. This photograph was recently taken by the Metropolitan Museum of Art with an infrared camera in order to bring out the graphite inscription. As you can see, the inscription is clearly visible. It reads, made by Caleb Gardner Jr., Newport, May 23rd, 1758. We've been able to discover quite a bit about the life of Caleb Gardner Jr. He was born in Brookline, Massachusetts, but moved to Newport with his family when he was a boy. He most likely trained to be an upholsterer in Newport, probably with another Newport upholsterer named Robert Stevens. Unfortunately, Gardner's career in Newport wasn't a success. Although the upholstery trade could be very lucrative, he struggled financially. He was jailed for debt in 1770 and his possessions were sold in order to satisfy his creditors. By 1783, he had reestablished himself as an upholster in Providence, where he lived until his death. Three easy chairs upholstered by Gardner are recorded in surviving invoices. With the exception of the back panel, this chair is covered in a needlework pattern called flame stitch. During the 18th century when the chair was made, this would have been called Irish stitch. Five colors of wool yarn were used, each in a variety of shades. We're looking here at the lower interior arm panel. This area was protected from light by the cushions, so the colors retain much of their original brightness. The upholstery is made up of separate panels. These are on the interior back, the inner arms, outer arms, front seat rail, and the cushion. Because there are subtle differences in the execution of the stitches and the placement of the colors in each panel, we believe that each was executed by a different hand. This indicates that these were probably professional embroiderers. They may have been working locally, but the panels may also have been imported from London. Now let's look at the chair's back panel, which is very different from the rest of its upholstery. We see a whimsical landscape with rolling hills, leaping deer and swooping birds, and a shepherd tending a sheep. Unlike the flame stitch, this was probably the work of a schoolgirl. Decorative needlework was an important part of women's education in colonial and federal America. Schoolgirls learned to sew by making samplers and often made more elaborate projects like needlework pictures or chair covers. These projects would be displayed in their homes as symbols of accomplishment. This needlework picture is related to a group of mid-18th century embroidered pictures made in Boston schools where young women from smaller towns and cities were often sent for schooling. It's very possibly the work of a Newport girl who was educated at a Boston Academy. Now let's look at the ornamental trimmings that Gardner used on this chair. First, he used a plain cord to create a raised border, which you can see here encircling the tops of the arms, wings, and crest. This originally would have been concealed with a strip of ribbon, which would have been sewn over it. There are still traces of it left, so we know it was black or dark green. Garner also used a wider yellow and green pattern tape and sewed it flat along the seat rails and the outside edges of the cone-shaped vertical elements that support the arms. On the seat rails, the black or dark green tape was centered on the wider pattern tape, creating a layered effect. This was held in place by decorative nails that were coated with tin to give them a silvered surface. They would have gleamed in candlelit interiors. Finally, let's take a look at what's underneath all this decorative needlework. Here you can see strips of webbing and linen sackcloth that would have supported the stuffing. Gardner used diagonal strips of webbing to reinforce the typical interwoven pattern and give added support to the seat. Here is an image of the chair's back panel when the needlework was removed for cleaning. You can see the twine that Gardner used to ensure that the generous amount of stuffing on the chair's interior surfaces stayed in place. These sophisticated techniques have kept the stuffing firmly in place for over 250 years, leaving behind a valuable document of 18th century upholstery practice. 